I have a story. Those four simple words came out of my older brother's mouth. Back at that very night on July 24th, 2009, over a decade ago, a night that has since haunted and left me curious of what was truly wandering in the woodlands of that little oak forest. I've spent hours every night for the past year trying to find anything online that would at least give me a, something as simple as the name of that forest. But I've never found it. I stared up at him, looking at his pale round face illuminated by the orange glow of the campfire, separating the two of us. I glared for a split second, cleared my throat as I hadn't said anything to anyone for the past few hours, and spoke with a condescending but humoring tone to my voice. You're kidding. No, I wasn't a disbeliever in cryptids, ghouls, and any monster that lurked in the dark crevices of the earth, whether they were undiscovered beings and creatures or something else entirely, but I obviously knew that whatever was going to come out of my brother's mouth was going to be a load of baloney. <laughs> Allow me to describe what I mean. He's not a good liar, but always seemed to find it amusing no matter the situation. He'd tell my mother with a straight face that he didn't take one of my belongings, even though he was obviously hiding it behind his back. He'd tell my frustrated dad, who had just read his not-so-successful report card, that C in algebra was a typo. In the end, my parents also had to sarcastically tell him that they believe him, and no matter what he did, never punished him for it, even though my mom could see his arm folded behind his back, and my dad could most definitely tell that Mr. Harris would not make a typo on something as crucial as a school report card. But their inability to continue fighting with him became more and more distinct throughout the years. Because one thing that was especially present to his lies was that he absolutely would never admit to his lies. One night back in 2003, my mom walked into his room and told him that he shouldn't be playing video games because he obviously didn't finish his homework, and this resulted in a full-blown tantrum by a literal nine-year-old. He crossed his arms, did his notorious scowl, and stomped his feet, until my mom threw her hands up and walked out in frustration, leaving him to resume playing on his PS2, ignoring the fact that his science teacher, Mrs. White, would blow a vein in her forehead when she discovered his unfinished homework. And just a few years later, when he was 11, he angrily refused to talk to my father about the detention he received that January afternoon. His PE teacher has caught him shoving down a girl in his class, and when he confronted him, he angrily screamed and spat in his face until he had to literally drag him out by the arm of the PE class. I remember his quotes so vividly that night, to his constantly changing story, that he was trying to keep explaining to my father. I didn't do it. Melissa pushed me first. Mr. Davis is the one lying, and he pushed me first. My attempts at relenting against him, telling him that a teacher wouldn't just push a student because they felt like it, were met with angry yells directed towards me, exclaiming that I was the stupid liar. So yeah, if you couldn't tell, I'm not very fond of my brother. But I am entirely off topic. Immediately, my brother scowled in frustration. My sarcastic remark had already upset him, and I knew that if I didn't dial it back a few seconds, my parents, sleeping inside the RV, would be immediately awakened and get on my case for making my brother upset. No, I'm serious. My God, Michael, can you not be an asshole for two seconds? My brother was a foul mouth. It started when he was 14 years old, and he pretty much cherished his vocabulary of swear words. Both of my parents were floored when the first time he casually dropped an F-bomb during dinner. And while my mom didn't care what he said, unless it was an insult directed towards someone, my dad made it absolutely clear that he wanted absolutely no swearing in his presence. And if not, he'd make him mow our huge front lawn every week for the next month. Yet when I was the only one who got caught, my dad would go ballistic and claim he'd trash every electronic in my room if he caught me swearing again. Yeah, whatever. Fine, fine, I'll humor you, Josh. Tell me your story. Take it seriously. I thought it would be nice, seeing how we're near this campfire in the middle of a cool night. I rolled my eyes, just barely able to contain any more sarcastic remarks toward him. All right, I will. Go ahead. I leaned back at the fallen log that I was sitting on, vividly remembering how uncomfortable it was. But that it was better off than sitting on the ground and having my mother get frustrated the next morning when she sees the stains of grass and dirt on the back of my pants. 
Ah. Uh, I vividly remember my brother looking around, almost as if he was searching for something. He was most definitely eager to tell me his story, yet when I let him, he suddenly became completely unprepared. I swallowed the urge to chuckle. In a few seconds, he asked me a question I didn't anticipate. You know what a skinwalker is, right, Mikey? I hated it when he called me Mikey, because most of the time, he does it to annoy me. But did he just ask me what a skinwalker is? I mean, I recognized the name, and some details of what exactly one was, but I had no idea he even cared about mythological creatures. I immediately began to think, trying to remember details, and the only thing I could prominently remember was that they were mythical monsters that could disguise themselves as humans by wearing their flayed skin like a suit. Sure, yeah. No, you don't. He scoffs and crossed his arms. Now, all we were missing is a repeated stomping and scarlet red coloration on his face, and we'll have a full blown episode. Fine, explain it to me. He begins to speak, talking in this obnoxiously ghoulish voice, doing these stereotypical ooh ghost noises in as much detail as he could remember. He informed me that skinwalkers are Navajo witches or warlocks capable of using black magic to shapeshift in animals, either through possession or disguising by flaying the pelt off of an animal and draping it over them, like some sort of demented suit of flesh and skin. And as I expected, that very method can be done to humans. I remember that he tells me a specific detail that even after learning about mythological skinwalkers online, I don't seem to understand where he got from. Maybe. He either made it up, or got it from an odd source. I wanted to bring it up to see if others know about it. And they say that the longer the witches and warlocks wear their stripped coats to disguise themselves, they become more and more of the very being they disguised as. The skin suits may eventually merge into their skin and become their new exterior one day, or gradually, bit by bit, they begin to sprout irreversible animalistic features, gray wolf fur, white eagle feathers, green snake scales. They start to hallucinate, lose memories, become confused, and eventually, absolutely psychotic, eventually revert to a completely animalistic phase, losing all of their humanity for good, the skinwalkers become their own skin. All skinwalkers know that they must not wear skin suits composed out of various different sources, as if they become their own skin. <laughs> he chuckled slightly. Quite the patchwork abomination may come out. They don't have a nickname for those types of transformed skinwalkers. Probably because they're so horrific that they should never be named. Whoa. I'm a bit brought back. For once in his life, what was coming out of his mouth was actually interesting to hear, whether it was a lie or not. He seemed to see my petrified state, mesmerized by his story, and slowly speaks again, asking me a question. Now, when a skinwalker steals one's skin, what happens to the body? It took a few seconds to respond back. As I had to abruptly escape my trance, I had no idea. Maybe they ate it. Maybe they disposed of it via burial. Maybe they dismember them and stick their several limbs together to make makeshift meat scarecrows to traumatize the village the now deceased person is from. It took me a second before it eventually... I had a pretty odd answer, but a pretty plausible one. They're witches, right? What if they turn them into mindless puppets, like minions or something like that? My brother's eyes widen for a split second, and he continues. Got it right on the money, somewhat. I was stunned for a few seconds, too. I, I didn't expect that to be the absolute right answer. So I was quite shocked that, apparently, my weird guess was right. Again, my brother continued. They call them the skin." Victims of the skinwalkers. The whole process of becoming a skinned can't seem to work on animals, and it's believed it's because their brains aren't complex enough. But the process can work on most humans. They become reanimated, like zombies, but, but not quite. From head to toe, 
Their skin has been removed, usually in a completely crude fashion, exposing layers and layers of peeled back flesh, lacerated muscles, and exposed tendons. He may be severely injured in appearance, as death by skinwalkers no clean one. So claw marks and tears can be dug into their flesh, leaving open scars that never heal. The lower half of their skulls had been peeled open, exposing the skull's jawbone and the permanently exposed teeth of the person. Some say the tongue is gouged out prior to the process so that the skin can't call for help if it retains some humanity, while some say the eye sockets are stabbed, blinding the skin so it can't see what it's become. Some say the skin have twisted limbs, forcing them to walk on all fours along the forest floor, and some say the skin they're disemboweled, leaving empty, uh, abominable cavities with no present organs. People don't know why they do this, but most believe it's simply the result of inflicted wounds prior to death and punctured holes through the sides of their chest, though the heat may symbolize that the skinwalker is a past lover of the victim who's had their heart broken and thus seeks revenge by stabbing straight through their own right before death. I got very curious, so I decided to shoot him a simple question. Why do the witches make the skin? What's the point of having minions if they're all damaged, you know, reanimated corpses? Again, you were somewhat right. I glared at him, confused. The skin aren't brought to life by the skinwalker themselves. When they obtain their skin suit, they usually abandon them to allow the elements to do the rest, break down their exposed bodies, turn them into, into mulch, to be absorbed into the earth over the course of several years, but through some supernatural influence, perhaps a, a failed attempt at revival, through another outer force, the corpse becomes a skin. I stopped glaring at him and asked another question. If they're not minions, what do they do? My brother chuckled again. I could see why, as he loved everything gruesome. He saw Freddy vs. Jason when it first came out in theaters back in 2003 and had the time of his life. They look for their stolen skin. They roam the forest that they were killed in for eternity, searching for whatever bastard witch or warlock left them a bleeding husk. The supernatural essence within them leaves them unable to rot and die, but over the years their soul begins to crumple and what little humanity was trapped in the near mindless being fades away for good. The skin are flayed of not just their bodies, but their humanity. I shivered pretty damn hard. Now that was scary. The idea of having some mythical creature robbing you of your skin and turning you into an undying zombie, endlessly searching for your lost flesh as you mentally wither into nothing, freaked me out. So much that my brother immediately noticed as he laughed and pointed towards me. <laughs> You're scared. I can see you shaking. I didn't like being caught in a moment of fear, so I retaliated. No, I'm shivering because it's cold. It was a half lie. While the faint wind brushed against my back, the glowing heat in front of me mostly canceled it out. Obviously, my brother caught me in my bluff, pointed at the nearby campfire, which was gradually dying down by now. Oh yeah, I'm sure it's absolutely freezing and dark, too. If only there was something here that could provide heat for us and light. All right, fine, you did scare me. But the fire is dying down. Let's go to the RV, get in the bed. Probably way too late, and Dad didn't want us to stay up late so we can wake up tomorrow. No, we're gonna go back on the road tomorrow by noon. I want to spend as much time here as I can. You just sleep in the RV during the day. Then, do you have any suggestions about what we can do? I can continue telling you a story. A friend of mine told me that he ran into a skinwalker a few years ago, wearing the skin suit of a dead wolf. I didn't think he was noticing the gradually fading glow of the campfire, so I pointed it out to him. Fire's dying down. It's because nearly all our fuel's been used up. Mikey, give me a solid. Go get some twigs. Josh, you want me to go out into the dark, damp forest alone in the middle of the night and go get more fuel? What, are you scared of a skinwalker? Might pop up and take your skin. <laughs> Don't be a wimp. There's sticks everywhere. It's not like you have to walk miles to find some. Come on, hurry up before the fire's dead. Nah, rock, paper, scissors for it. And no two out of three. If I win, you do it. My brother scoffs in frustration, mumbling, Fine, under his breath, and stands up, approaching me. I vividly remember our little match of RPS. I was hoping that I didn't have to go, 
and I didn't feel like doing so. But my choice of scissors against his choice of rock proved otherwise. I win. Rock beats scissors. Now go. My brother quickly speaks and pointed over my shoulder. I grumbled in frustration but knew I couldn't protest, as it was my idea. So I turned around, kicked my feet, and took a couple slow steps. My brother's joking demand of, if the fire's dead before you're back, the skinwalkers might get you, got on my nerves. It motivated me to pick up the pace as I wanted to be done with it as soon as possible. I think I was walking for a good few minutes. I don't remember what I was doing, but I think I just had my hands in my pockets, thinking about our little vacation trip. Back in early July, our parents thought of our excessive days of just playing video games for 12 hours straight and then going to sleep was corrupting our minds, and they wanted us to take a five-day road trip to clear our minds. Both of them had entirely different views on video games. That's why my mom normally just didn't want us to be excessively having our eyes glued to a television screen. My dad absolutely believed with the whole idea that video games caused violence and banned graphic video games, strictly limited video game time on our family computer and told us games like GTA 3 were made by a bunch of lowlives who wanted to brainwash kids and literally turn them into raving lunatics. Until we were 18, he wanted absolutely nothing excessively violent on our gaming consoles, or that if we were caught with it, we would have to not only return the game from where we'd bought it, but humiliate yourself by writing an apology letter to whoever it was bought from. And if that wasn't enough salt in the wound, very limited video game times for the next month. After around three or so minutes, my train of thought came to a halt, and I remembered what I was out here for. I took my hands out of my pockets and searched around, eventually finding piles of fallen wooden branches on the ground. Before I scooped up as much as I could, with prominent handfuls, before turning around and starting my way back, Walking back, my train of thought kept going again, and I picked up where I left off. If it wasn't obvious, my father loves to utilize fear as a scaring mechanism into stopping us from doing things he doesn't like. While my mother absolutely hates it, and it sparks countless fights between them, just before the trip, Dad got curious one night, found some lewd sights on the history of my brother's personal computer, and lost his mind. Mom tried to tell him that he was just curious, while my brother just flat out called him out on a supposed bluff. Eventually, Mom shooed us out of the room and fought with Dad in private for an hour straight, so much that it actually exhausted him. I heard very little details through the muffled shouts in the next room over, but I could tell Mom was sick of Dad's method of traumatizing us, but Dad thinks that Mom's giving us so much freedom that we think we could do whatever we wanted. So all they stated this whole road trip was to give us some fresh air, I think it was mainly because of the tension in between them but they didn't want to flat out tell us. And then, I stopped. Nothing had caught my attention. My whole train of thought just stopped. Like it derailed, like it, it wasn't like I just abruptly snapped back out of it. It's as if it had just abruptly concluded and wrapped itself up. And that's when it hit me. Why I stopped. I looked around in confusion, searching through the shadowy trunks and branches of the old oak trees before me. I was frozen, and that's when I truly realized why I'd stopped. I didn't recognize where I was. I remember that even while I was first thinking, I could recognize subtle details in my trail. A lonely, rotted tree stump, a crumpled up can of either beer or soda resting in a pile of leaves, few jagged patches of gravel I had to walk over. I searched and searched and searched for any of those details, but they were nowhere to be seen. No, it, it's not possible. I, I had turned around a full 180 degrees when I got those sticks. It's not like I just... I just got lost out of nowhere. I searched around. Everything was quiet. Too quiet. It's like a horror movie. Building up a sudden loud jump scare, a blaring scream to deafen me, and uh, the face of a deceased, mutilated creature to lunge out of the darkness to maul me and, and take my skin. God damn it! I yelled out in frustration. If my father was just a few feet behind me. I would have gotten a raw slap to the back of my head for yelling God's name in vain, but he wasn't. I was dead lost in the middle of a forest, alone, while it was the middle of the night. I was immediately consumed with a chilling feeling, one stronger than the weak, ice-cold winds. It was my blood freezing and shivers running up and down my spine. It was... It was panic. Joshua! I yelled out. I knew wherever I was, he probably couldn't hear me, but 
I just wanted noise in the forest besides my own gradually quickening exhales. I yelled again, frozen in place. Joshua! Nothing. No. No, I, I knew where I was just a few minutes ago. Never in my life had I been so paranoid. I was absolutely shocked to my core. I could barely move my upper body while everything below my pelvis was anchored to the ground. I, I, I vividly remember trying to lift my left foot, but that's... It's as if I was wearing a steel toe boot welded to the ground. I stood there for about a few minutes straight, just trapped in place as my breathing grew more and more hysterical. I couldn't move my legs. I couldn't hear anything. I couldn't even open my hands and drop the handfuls of twigs stuck to my palms. It was, it was so surreal, and my own personification was the only thing keeping me from full-blown trembling in the absolute shock. I felt, I felt lightheaded as I was breathing like, the, like my life depended on it, and then, just then, I heard it. The first noise within the last eight or so minutes, a noise that I can recall in so much detail despite its immensely short length and abruptness. I didn't even know what it was at first, but it eventually came into my mind, and when I realized what it most likely was, I nearly vomited right then and there. It was the loud crunching of twigs, snapping under someone's foot. Joshua! I held so loud my voice cracked. For a half second, went high pitched. At that very moment, I didn't care if whatever it was was potentially a wild animal or a, an escaped knife wielding mental patient sneaking up on me. It's as if nothing in the world mattered to me at that very moment, a moment that only lasted just a few seconds until I heard it again. Another twig snapping. I didn't know where it was coming from. But I absolutely knew that it was getting closer. Not like this. Anything but like this. I remember that glimmers of life seemed to flash before my eyes. Potential death in my mind. I got mauled to death by a feral animal, semi-eaten. I get gutted to death by a, by a maniacal laughing serial killer and buried under a huge patch of gravel. Or I, I never escape my petrified state and get discovered in the morning. Curled in the forest floor in the fetal position. Died of exposure. I would have preferred that last method. It was at least uh, less gruesome. And then I heard it. What came next was, at first, entirely familiar. The third snap of a twig, but was followed just milliseconds later by a sound that I could easily describe, but can't put together in words how bone-chilling it was. A slow, guttural, groan. It was a person. What I, I was hoping it was, for, from the best I could put together, it was like the final breath of a smoker succumbing to lung cancer, or the, the mangled, raspy exhale of someone's life being sucked out of them via strangulation. It was human, all right, yet not natural. It was a sound of absolute agony. No man can generate that sound at will. I heard it again. I got another listen to it, much clearer than before. It was sickening, beyond disturbing, though it felt very different. It took me a few seconds to understand why. The first sound was an exhale, and this one, this one was an inhale. I'm praying by now, praying that whatever is happening is just some, some messed up prank by Josh and stuff like the inability to locate those subtle details in his, his misformed gasps were just my mind twisting details from an existing amount of fear. Maybe I had dozed off at the campsite or whatever this was, it was a nightmare. I'd pinch myself if I could, but by now my fingers were stuck together. All I could do was wiggle the tips of my thumbs. I heard it again, a twig snapping, followed by the mangled inhale. I stayed silent for a few seconds. There it was, a twig snapping, a grotesque exhale. It was almost a rhythm, and after a while it seemed to recognize that the space in between the combination of a, of a breaking branch and warped export or intake of breath was almost perfect every day, so much that I even counted it. It was nearly six seconds. I couldn't really tell if my fear had faded away by then. I was perplexed by the near-inhuman sounds, and the only thing affecting me was my inability to mostly move and the faint winds that I had been 
so long in that my teeth were chattering. Abruptly, everything just ended. The unusual noises were gone, and now I could, I could at least hear the faint whooshing of the wind before me. I felt pins and needles in my hands and legs, so intense that they hurt, as if all the blood flow in them had stopped. I straightened my fingers, flexed my toes, and gradually lifted my left foot, finally taking my first step in what I think was at least 20 minutes. I think at that moment I was convinced whatever just occurred was some sort of fear-induced psychotic episode. Those strange noises were auditory hallucinations my brain created, and finally, I managed to snap out of my episode and the noises abruptly left. Though upon a couple seconds after the ending of my presumed episode, I, I felt that an unusual warmth in my face, so I opened my left hand, allowing me to drop the mass of sticks as they crashed to the ground and rubbed my face in confusion. Tears running down my eyes. I was involuntarily crying. But now I knew that it was just all a part of the episode. I, I started to slowly walk again, but I was still recovering from what the, whatever the hell had just happened. So while I wanted to run until I knocked all the air out of my lungs, I could only slowly drag my feet. I felt an overwhelming feeling of warmth wash over, a sign that everything seemed to be okay now. How absolutely wrong I was. How dead wrong I was. Never in my life had I ever been that wrong before. And the, my body gave me an overwhelming feeling that it was all over. But all that really was was the appetizer before the main course. What happened next has traumatized me to a massive degree. And for the next few weeks, I had recurring nightmares. I'm forced to relive this moment every time. If I had a full bladder, I would have definitely emptied it by then. What came next was not human. Nothing capable of living can generate this noise, not even, not even a demon straight out of hell. In this horribly distorted, jarring voice, I can nowhere near replicate when retelling the story to my friends and family, it uttered a single word. When I couldn't understand it first, but after this, I finally realized what it said. Skin. I don't know what scared me more. The abruptness and the volume of it, or the fact that unlike the sounds of snapping twigs and raspy groans, I could understand where it was coming from. A few feet behind me. And then I heard it. The dragging, the clawing, the swishing of soil, the cracking of the branches that I had dropped behind as it writhed over them like a giant leech. Before I could fully register its existence, I had gradually spun my head around and got a good look at what it was. It was what I wasn't hoping for. It was a twisted, mutilated human being, and if you couldn't tell from all the buildup, it was a skinwalker victim, flayed nearly to the skeleton with dissected layers of muscle, flesh, and other body parts exposed, formerly under the layers of skin that formerly protected its body. I remember the face, gutted and punctured with the right side, looking like someone had taken a claw hammer to it, so much I could see sections of its skull. Its empty right eye socket and nasal cavity were crushed with a combination of what looked like dried blood and mucus while the left eye had absolutely no color. It was dead. It was not alive. It, it shouldn't be alive. Its teeth still pearly white as if, it was, as if it was alive and almost glowing in the moonlight were fully exposed from the lack of lips, yet no, no pair of dentures. They were gnarled, sickly, and stained with various colors of substances I didn't even want to get a better look at. I could now understand its malformed breathing as its, as its trachea was slit wide open, exposing a gaping hole in the front of its neck. What I formerly thought was the sound of, of crawling was not crawling. That thing was walking on all fours, its elbows pointed up to the sky, and while I couldn't see it at first, its knees were, were twisted backwards, allowing to essentially move its legs backwards. One thought was in my mind during the good ten or so seconds I had my eyes set on the creature. Not the fact that I was literally looking at a real, genuine version of the creature my brother had told me just a half an hour prior, but the fact that it was dragging its extremities along the ground and scuttling towards me. I heard it speak again, this time seeing its mouth move. I don't understand how it could muster fully audible words with no lips on its face and, and visible damaged muscles in its jaw, but it could. 
Skin! Thoughts flooded my mind so rapidly that I could barely register them as soon as they popped up. What I was looking at was not a creature that should be alive. It was a an abomination that freed inside of whatever rotted chamber it had been locked in years ago and needed to get the hell away from it now. Before my body could re-paralyze itself, I opened my grip, allowing my body to drop another handful of twigs before I turned around and took a random path in the direction I had been searching and ran like my life depended on it. And when I took off, I think it did. Because I heard that creature speak the only three words I could understand in that moment. Give it back. Give it back. The end of its final word gradually began to warp as it transformed into a ghoulish howl. By the time I had gotten around ten or so yards from it, I heard its howl twist into what I could describe as an ear-splitting shriek. One my brother would never have the lung capacity to do. I knew what I did. I pissed it off, and before I could start praying that it was slower than me, I remember what kind of being I was dealing with. Somehow through its agonizing screech, it was chasing, it was chasing me. I didn't know how long I ran, but I ran until there was little air in my lungs and stomach bile in my throat. I nearly threw up in my mouth, yet I just kept running because I could hear that thing in hot pursuit, and through an absolute miracle, I saw it. The silhouette of my parents' RV through the gnarled branches I was plowing through, blocking my face with my arms and leaves cutting against my the undersides of my forearms, through the gaps in my fingers that was shielding my face, I saw glimmers of the smoke rising from the now-extinguished campfire. The second I had escaped the trees and pretty much flung myself into the empty area where my parents had set up camp, I immediately emptied my stomach contents. My vomit was hot and boiling from all the stress that I had just inflicted on my body, and it scorched the inside of my throat. I glanced upward, my vision reduced from the tears and sweat in my eyes. But I could see the outline of my brother, standing just feet away from me. Michael! Michael, holy hell, where the hell have you been? And that's when I realized something. I hadn't. Just escaped. There was no finish line. The thing was still after me, and within seconds I jumped up to my feet, my legs aching and my entire body overheated. Never in my life had I run as much as that, nowhere near as more than any miles I had run in P.E. I could only muster out a couple of words before my voice was cancelled out by the petrifying scream of the creature. It had stopped screaming for just a few seconds, just enough for my brother to not get a full listening to it, because it had lost me. But both an extremely exhausted me and my own brother were in its radius. I can remember what I said, and as clear as day, we need to get in the RV right now. My brother told me at a later date that when he heard that screech of whatever was in the forest, he almost pissed himself right there. Before I could even blink, he had his arm scooped under his armpits, and he had me dragged into the RV within a span of around five seconds. Did it so fast that I was shocked he didn't get a hernia. And to this day, this is the greatest thing he's ever done for me. If he had left me in a panic, I wouldn't be online to tell this story. That thing would have, would have burst out of the shadows, would have wrapped an outstretched hand around my ankles, would have dragged me into the darkness. Or oh, never would have been seen again. The booming bang of my brother slamming the RV door and locking it immediately woke both my parents. But before my father could self-detonate and chew him out for waking them up, their gazes immediately averted to me, who had left sweating, crying, and wrenching on the RV floor. I remember my mother immediately coming to my aid, horrified, because she would tell me years later she had never seen me in such a state of absolute disarray. My father interrogated my brother, unsure of what to make of my current state, but believed my brother was still behind it. My ears were ringing badly. I could hear what he was telling him. There's something in the woods! We heard it! And it didn't sound like a wild animal! My father showed immediate disbelief, but I remember through choked gasps, I assured him that I ran directly into it, and it chased me out of the woods. My parents were mortified upon realization that my brother wasn't lying again. My father urgently asked what I had seen in the woods. I remember what I said, word for word. There was a person on all fours, with no skin. What came next was a blur. My own body started to power down from how much energy I had drained myself of, and even though I struggled to stay awake, 
Just in seconds, I felt myself slip out of consciousness. All I remember is my brother frantically telling something to my parents and my, my panicking mother scooping me up. I woke up an undetermined time later, and a couple years later, while reciting the story to my brother, he told me that I was out for about 11 hours straight and I slept dead silent. I remember waking up in the back of the RV on my bed. My dad driving, my mom in the front seat, my brother on his bed, lying down and playing his Nintendo DS. Everyone was silent and my brain was flooded so much that it took me hours to remember the events of the last night. My brother and I talked. Just an hour later, I, I asked him what the actual hell happened just last night, and he told me not to talk about it at all until we got home. I didn't particularly understand what he meant at first. I just, just a couple hours later, I discovered that our road trip had been cut a day short. However, it would be years until I would understand what truly happened after I lost consciousness. My mother said nothing. But my father always silenced me, telling me he never wanted to speak of it. My brother was the only one who would talk to me about it, but told me he didn't remember what happened after I passed out either, since he fell asleep as well and wanted to hear it from my father. But he always acted as if it never even seemed to happen. I had my nightmares. They plagued me so bad, but they eventually went away. Some were either me re-experiencing when I was paralyzed in the middle of the forest, listening to the sounds of snapping twigs and distorted groans, while well, some were me fleeing and fleeing from that horrific creature that was chasing me, hysterically screaming. After around a few months, the whole thing escaped my mind. I, it wasn't until somehow over a decade later the whole experience reappeared in my mind during a conversation with my brother about past vacations. That road trip popped up. I remember him talking over lunch, and surprisingly, he found the whole thing so mysterious and odd. I asked him a few questions, some I remember how long I was gone. He informed me it was at least over an hour. He got extremely worried that I'd gotten lost. I told him I did. I described my whole episode. I was just anchored to place and heard those noises over and over again. I asked him where he got the whole information of the skinned, because I can't find anything like it online. He told me the same friend who supposedly encountered a skinwalker, told him. My brother thought they were made up at first, but wanted to amuse me with a story of them on that very night. I asked him why he apparently couldn't hear that thing screech for the first time. He told me that oddly, everything was dead silent, and it wasn't until I lurched free from the forest that he heard that thing's wails. And that's when I remember my most important question. The question... I've been trying to think of an answer for, for years. Josh, when I got back into the RV, and and I told Dad I, it was some messed up creature, what happened after I passed out? My brother froze for a few seconds, looking down at his plate and just chewing. He swallowed his food and finally spoke. Dad told me to lie to you before I woke up. He knew what happened. Mom and I both witnessed it, but they didn't want you to know any details. The whole experience messed you up good, at least for a few weeks. You had night terrors, right? Yeah, I did. But what did you see? Um, the rest of the night was um, silent after that. The thing... It probably wandered off, or was never able to find us, so I remember we all kind of just fell asleep in our beds. Mom embraced you the whole time. You were mumbling in your sleep. Four words. They weren't coherent at first, and I guess only I heard them because Mom and Dad were both asleep by then. I don't have it. That thing. It yelled at me before I started running. I this screech of a voice give it back I think that's why my brother picked at his teeth before continuing to talk yeah that's um, that's not all uh, I remember waking up in the morning mom and dad were outside the RV 
Mom was horrified and crying. Dad couldn't look, so I came out and Mom tried to cover my eyes, but I saw it. Um, nearly through right there. Sheriff, uh, Sheriff came just a couple minutes later. If you're wondering, he was no help. I stared at him with a combination of curiosity and fright. I, I felt an overwhelming chill run down my spine, though, though one that would never compare to the ones I had while I was stuck in the middle of the forest. What did you see? Sides of the RV, even the roof, were covered in reddish-brown splotches, visibly dried and crusted into the RV's paint. My brother winced for a split second, but continued staring me in the eyes. They are all shapes I didn't recognize at first, but seconds before Mom covered my eyes, I could tell that uh, they were handprints. While we slept, that bastard came back and crawled all over the RV. I finished his sentence. Because it was looking for me. I don't know what truly lurks in the dark crevices of Earth. I know now not all of them are feral. Some used to be people, like you and me. But they were robbed of everything they had. The very matter that covers their bodies shields the meats from the outside world, the cold, empty outside world. It's driven me crazy. I remember thinking about how negative my brother was, bringing up all these awful things that he's done in the past, how much I despise him prior, yet he saved my life. What if he was the one who went out into the forest? What if he was the one who ran out, out of breath, and was vomiting? What if I abandoned him? What if he was the one who was dragged into the forest, gone without a trace? I would never, ever see him again. Not me, not our parents, not our friends or teachers, or other supervisors he's had that have broken their backs over the years trying to make him a nicer person. If the chances were different that night, one of us would not be present today. Maybe even both. And there's one thing that still unnerves me about this incident. It's, it's whatever that creature truly was. It's still out there. In that dark, silent forest. Condemned to walk in animate limbo. Searching for not just its ripped away skin and flesh, but something else that was ripped out of it. It's soul. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and thank you for watching today's video. And if you're on the podcast, then thank you for watching today's podcast. And if you're on uh, not the video or the podcast, then thank you for tuning into this telepathic broadcast. Oh, and there's something I need to mention to all of you. It's actually the big Halloween surprise. I mentioned this early on in the summer, but I never really got a chance to say what it was, because it wasn't really nailed down at the time. We, and by we, I mean me, Creeps McPasta, and Mew, are going on tour across the United States in October. All the dates for it have been nailed down as of, actually, today, and tickets should be going on sale as of, actually, today. If you'd like to find out more, I'm going to have a bunch of information in the description down below all the way up until the tour is finished. But if you want to get a hold of your tickets, all the venues we've chosen have very limited seating, so make sure you get your tickets now if we're heading to a town near you. And one of the most exciting things about this is that I've been able to work with Mew across the United States doing conventions over the past couple of years. But this is the first time I think that Creeps McPasta is coming to the U.S., and it's especially the first time I'm going to be able to work with him live on stage. So this is going to be a show that's bigger than anything I've ever dreamed of being able to do in my entire YouTube career. So check it out down below at marginwalkerpresents.com to get a hold of your tickets and come see us to celebrate Spooktober. Especially, I want to give a big thank you to my Patreon supporters. You guys over at patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta are the best. Especially, Trace Miles, Talon Karlick, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Wayne Milstead, Dr. Strawberry, Daniel Polson, Champinsky, Ken Lando Higuchi, Rev Miroku, Brianna Ventine Jensen, Nicholas Said El Yassin, Buddy Burrows, Stephen Van Huss, Tristan Pelton, Goonington, G Weevil 3, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, Asia, Gabrielle DeBaca, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Sandy Barney, Titty Connoisseur, Melissa Swaygart, Kudir Max, Jay Kerbine, Dante Rao, Last Blade Song, 
Chris Wrights, The Gender Bros, Mads Beck Lorenzen Post, Don Mulmeister, Eliminator86, Nebsky, Andrew Stenberg, Jason Silsma, Steampunk Center, and Rafael Rodriguez. If you guys would like to join them, you can head over to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. And that's it for tonight. Sweet dreams, everyone. <laughs>